yeah, let's start uh, right down there. You, sir, first question. Hi. Uh, so I love that all the sessions today were about like from very different perspectives. So it was like design, accessibility, performance. But for me, like I work on a website, and there was one thing missing for me, and it was SEO. So how, like it seems like when you use lots of custom, so it's slightly related to the accessibility, I guess. Like you, you can implement the semantics using a lot of attributes, but this still like it does seem to have like all this JavaScript dependencies. So I guess is it? Can you make it work with search engines, or would you basically need a completely different tool? Or yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. So that's a question we get a lot. Uh, and just kind of right off the bat, working with Polymer in terms of SEO is absolutely no different than building apps with any other JavaScript library or framework you might use. The problems and challenges are exactly the same with SEO for Polymer as you would get for an Angular React app or anything like that. Uh, which also means, fortunately, that the same set of tools that are available in terms of SEO uh, also work with Polymer. Um, so if you're building single page apps, you're going to you know, naturally need to uh, pre-render and pre-render -pre on, on the server side uh, your application so that it can't be picked up by search engines. Uh, and so all the set of kind of services that you might use to pre-render your Angular application, uh, pre-render IO is one of them, there are a number more, uh, they all work with Polymer as well. So essentially, same set of problems with single page apps, same set of solutions. Uh, and if you, if you build your site just like any other site uh, in terms of SEO, you'll get the same results. So it's no different. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, you, sir. Um, you've, in, you've introduced us today to uh, PolyGit and PolyLint, uh, quite nice set, sets of features, uh, but uh, things that don't exist in JavaScript. But they do, for example, exist in the Dart language. Will we see continued cooperation with uh, Dart? I can take that one as well. <laughs> um, yes, so fortunately, yes. Uh, so the Polymer.dart .dart, um, Dart version of the Polymer library um, is still being actively worked on. Uh, so they are working really hard to get a Dart, Polymer.dart .dart .dart for Polymer 1.0 out uh, by the end of this quarter, so end of this month approximately is the goal, uh, which is great. It's a small team. It's a really small team, just like the Polymer team, working really hard. Uh, and we, we love that all, all the work that they do. Um, so they actually already have a branch of Polymer.dart for Polymer 1.0 up, so you can check it out and kind of uh, poke around. And hopefully it'll be, it's, it, they're still you know, working on it actively, uh, but hopefully very, very soon it, it'll be production ready. So let me do a, a quick Twitter question here because it's in a similar vein. Uh, a lot of folks are wondering how does Polymer and Angular, how are they going to coexist? Is this going to be the, the Taylor <laughs> the Taylor show? <laughs> they. Um, okay. Oh. <laughs> I get the fun questions. Um, so there's a there's a lot of JavaScript frameworks out there. Even though Polymer is not a framework, it's a library. Um, so and really there will always be a lot of libraries and frameworks out there. So the fact that we're both part of Google is just sort of a side effect of the fact that Google's a very big place working on a lot of projects all at the same time. Um, so we work really well together with, with Angular, um, especially with their upcoming 2.0, which supports web components. Uh, we've done a bunch of work to, to work on interop with it. Um, and a lot of projects inside of Google are actually using Angular and, and um, Polymer together. Um, so we think there's, a, you know, there's absolutely a niche for every single library out there. I think you guys have probably authored some yourselves. Um, and I think, you know, they'll, they'll continue to work together. All right. Uh, you, sir, at the microphone. Uh, I don't know if I missed this, but uh, that question came up in the, in the breaks. Uh, how, does, how does browser caching play with Polymer caching in the current state of affairs? Uh, are there collisions? Are, do things get messy? Uh, is there anything I have to look out for? Thanks. Um, I guess I can speak to that quickly. Um, no, there sh really shouldn't be any issue. Um, you know, HTML imports, which is the you know primary platform tool that Polymer uses to grab dependencies, um, you know, fundamentally are implemented in the platform and support browser caching just fine. Works really well with Surface Worker that was talked about a lot today too. So, I mean, really everything should just work well and and be fine. There's really no issues there. Okay. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, uh, another question from Twitter. Uh, someone asked, building an accessible website can sometimes be ugly. You've got things you know, like 
focus rings and stuff like that. Is there anything that Polymer can help with in that department? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, so if you're actually using some of the paper elements, um, or even like the gold input elements, um, those are actually going to come with a really nicely designed focus state with them. Um, that's, that's definitely one way that you could go with it. Another way that you can consider is that if you're not, if you're not going to be using the paper or the gold input in, um, element, um, excuse me, elements, <laughs> um, if you're building your own, you're going to have some focus rings and focus states that are available that are going to be built in. Um, one thing to consider there is that that sort of look and feel, that focus ring, um, it might not always go with your site or your app. And that's totally valid if you don't feel that that's, that's the right sort of way to go. Um, the, the good thing to consider here, though, is that you can work with your designers to work in a focus state as part of the design from the very beginning. So accessibility really feels like a very um, just integrated part of the entire flow, as opposed to something that's just kind of tacked on top. So. Um. From the super nerdy techie part, um, we try to make behaviors to actually help with this. So we've made the inky focus behavior. I couldn't name it anything better at the time. But that basically lets you, if you have a ripple, when you're focused, you display that ripple. Because it's probably going to be slightly nicer than, um, than the blue out outline. So ch checkbox does this, radio button does that. Uh, paper button's a little bit different, but that one also has a behavior that you can over override if you don't like it for your particular button. Um, and if you're using iron control state, which basically tells you what's going on with your button, you can always like listen to what's happening on focus and make your own style. Um, so at least like all the hooks are there, and then you can style it however you want. Great. Uh, another question, you sir, down at the mic. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for this awesome event. That's seriously cool. Um, question on an, a technical part. Uh, say you have two components. One is built with Web Components JS. 1.0 and the other is built with 1.1. How would you incorporate it in one application without conflicts or dependencies? Sorry. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so, so there's, a, there's a couple of parts to this uh, question. Um, so first, uh, yeah, so in, in the current version of, of custom elements and, and uh, web components, we don't really have true um, kind of isolation between uh, elements that you can register. So, um, you know, it's possible that, you know, one component pulls in a, a dependency of a paper button 1.0 and another one pulls in a dependency of a paper version 1.1, for example. Um, and right now, elements are registered into a, a, a global registry. Um, and we know that this is really unsatisfying, and this might, uh, I don't know, we typically get get questions like this. So this, you know, we recognize that this is very unsatisfying, and it's really kind of an artifact um, of the fact that specs are really hard to get through, especially you know when we're trying to get cross-browser specs pushed through. Um, and this was actually a you know a known uh, you know deficiency or conceit of the version one of the custom element spec um, in order to get consensus and to get it pushed through. So that's really like on the version two of custom elements is re to really tackle the the uh, kind of the notion of how, how can custom elements be registered um, or s scoped into kind of scoped or registered into scoped registry so that you can have uh, kind of multiple versions of the same component on the on the page? So I think that's that's one part of the answer. Um, however, you know the other way I like to look at it um, is that you know if you think of the npm model where you know each each package can pull down its own dependencies and its own versions and then. Each of, each of those can pull down its own versions. And you, you may have seen like crazy uh, dependency trees where you have 97 versions of the same you know, async uh, package or something. Um, and that, that model, while it, it's nice from a, you know, um, you know it's possible to, do, to put all these things together point of view, when you look at on the client side, it's really just kind of incompatible. So even if we built a system that allowed you to have like 47 versions of paper button, the first thing you would want to do was go like get that down to one version of paper button. And so, um, you know, when we think about client-side tech, it's just a little bit different. And, and so ultimately, we're, right now, we're kind of pushing the pain forward to say, resolve the dependencies first, um, because that's going to, you know, ultimately end up in the, the smallest payload for your app. Um, yeah. So follow, sorry, a follow-up question on that. So would you then advise not to use, for example, third-party dependencies, because you don't have control on that? Um, it, it's more just that you know right now for when you're using Bower, Bower will will identify the, the conflicts and then you know th there's a there's a process of resolving them. Yeah. 
So, you know, by leveraging the, the, the package tool, while, you know, we have a love-hate relationship with, you know, the current state of package management, you know, the good thing is that they, they can highlight where, where you have dependency conflicts and, and help you resolve them. All right, uh, let's take one from over on this side. Yep, hi, uh, I got another question about the uh, accessibility, because I know there are problems with uh, accessibility and the focus event uh, around the shadow DOM but does the shady DOM helps somehow in it? So um, we would like the shady DOM to be as close to the shadow DOM as possible. In the perfect world, everybody would have the shadow DOM and we wouldn't need to use the shady DOM. So if you're doing things where you're taking advantage of the shady DOM um, because you think that helps you fix focus issues, um, that's kind of like a bonus of the shitty DOM, but it shouldn't be there. So you should probably file a bug and we'll fix it so that it doesn't work for you anyway. But um, there shouldn't really be discrepancies between what, how focus works on the shitty DOM and how focus works on the shadow DOM. And we, event like, we occasionally, in Elements, find bugs where we've dug ourselves into a hole because focus is hard. And then we keep trying to fix it so that shitty DOM and shadow DOM fo focus do exactly the same thing. I just want, sorry, quickly I wanted to add one thing, which is just that there's actually a lot of complex, pretty technical behavior around focus. If you consider, for example, I know, in, I think it was in Monica's talk, she showed the input type date, which has the pop-up. And if you think about that focus state, I mean, there's like, if, if you think about the notion that there's that element's focus state, okay, so it's focused, but then the actual keyboard is gonna go to the specific, like, date or, t or month or year field, that's pretty tricky. And this is an area, in particular in Shadow DOM, where the spec is still sort of evolving and the behavior is evolving. It's an active area of development in Chrome where actually we're sort of, there's sort of experimental implementation going on which will help inform the spec and, and hopefully this will be something that'll, that'll evolve relatively soon. Um, because again, we wanna sort of get to the point where we can very easily make kind of that kind of complex behavior that you can do in these, in these uh, you know, built-in elements. I just want to point out that this is kind of an interesting aspect of Polymer being part of the, the web platform team at Google, um, is that when the, the guys who are, you know, working on new browser features like Shadow DOM and like, you know, these questions about focus, you know, have a concrete, you know, question, like how, how should this work? You know, they have a team that they can come to is at, like sitting there right on the bleeding edge of, of what all you guys are doing um, out there on the web. And we can actually, you know, give them feedback and really tighten the loop back with, with the browser vendor. So I think this is a, it's a really, it's a really smart thing I think that, that Google chose to do with, with kind of having a client side framework work so clo closely with the, the platform team. Also right. focus is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> like literally the hardest. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, another one from Twitter, and this is actually something someone asked me in person out on the floor the other day too. Uh, what's the best way to share data across elements? <laughs> Number one, <laughs> think locally. Number two, composition. Number three, the meet. Yeah. What about so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? You guys got it. Listen, listen to the the first tech talk. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, that's basically the answer. I mean, you know, we. Like I went into excruciating detail, we've kind of codified this notion of you know being able to share data through a tree, um, but not in a super undeterministic way. It's all shared from one mediator to another to another, and then those notifications you know always flow through that tree through those connections that you've made uh, in the bindings. Um, and so you know in, in general you know app. You know, application data that is truly shared, that doesn't need mediation, that doesn't need someone to kind of make a decision in between before it's propagated, um, it's very easy to just use Polymer's two-way binding system. And I think, you know, you know, the one, you know, place that sometimes comes up is, yeah, I, I started out binding this stuff together and then I realized that, um, you know, but I needed to put like an if statement in there somewhere. How do I do that? And that's just kind of, uh, you know, a, a sniff test that, you know, these things aren't actually shared. They should probably have two names, and then there's some mediator that's, you know, making some decision and, and passing the data along. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's really key. You know, hopefully you have a better understanding now of what the, what the data binding system in Polymer is actually doing. Um, and then you can make the decision when you want to just fall back to, you know, kind of using events and, and mediating the data manually versus, versus kind of using the, the built-in data binding. Okay. Uh, over there. 
Uh, hi. So um, we've done a lot of work on our components to follow the structured data model or schema.org stuff. So my first part of the question is, one, will those components, although we've tested them inside the tool, will they actually be picked up as rich snippets? And the second part was, are you doing any work with elements for um, those kind of things, like schema tags and social tags? Yes, uh, great question. Absolutely, and 100%. Uh, it will work. It will get picked up um, by browser or by by search engines and shown as rich snippets. And we've actually done a lot of experimentation with this um, at Google. The 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 uh, search engine crawling team. There is a strict firewall between them and any client teams. So we have as much information out there uh, as all you have in terms of actually how the internals of the search engine work. Uh, but we actually have done a bunch of experiments, and there's some there are experiments live on GitHub um, that were posted about a while back, about a year ago now, uh, on the Chrome developers blog uh, that goes into exactly this. And it's an example, exam multiple examples of Polymer elements that get internal state and data, and then expose that uh, explicitly uh, through uh, attributes that can then be picked up, you know, schema.org attributes, things like that and get picked up throughout the entire loop and then rendered as rich snippets and things like that. So absolutely it works, and it's actually a really cool model um, because we can expose this data. I think the example was you, wanna, you have a location uh, and you wanna expose that location data so that it's picked up uh, by the search engine. And you, know, you only have to have that data once. You, know, you don't have to now, like if, you're, if you were hand, hand coding or hand coding this markup uh, with schema.org, you, you kinda have to repeat yourself in where you put uh, the location, latitude, and longitude in the schema.org, and then in your data and how it flows throughout your, your application. Uh, but fortunately, with data binding and reflecting to attributes, you can just have that data once in your application, and it can be both exposed through the schema.org, and it can be exposed however your app needs to expose it. Um, so it's absolutely a use case that, that works well. Uh, what about rival social networks? Uh, it's schema.org, uh, so you know, they, I, however, whatever social networks support that markup would, would support this. Um, and similarly, OpenGraph, you can do a very similar, uh, similar strategy with reflecting it, and it should, should work. I can't speak, obviously, to uh, how other networks do their fetching and their parsing and their crawling, uh, but ultimately, again, exact same things you'd run into with any type of, of JavaScript rendered application. Uh, it, should, it should work, um, and you just have to try it out. Great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, over here. Hi guys. Uh, there are a lot of bugs nowadays. Like uh, web components are cool, but not cool enough yet. Polymer is cool, but not cool enough yet. And just to make it clear, for your opinion, what is the weakest point of Polymer now? And how can we as a developers help to improve that? And uh, yeah. Well, let me give you my take. <laughs> um, I think the, the, maybe the weakest point is, from my perspective, sort of as a core engineer on the team, is a very technical point, which is just that we are embracing the platform we think is the future, but it's very hard for us because while Chrome's implementation is great and native in there, it's really hard to try to polyfill this behavior on other browsers. And the work that we have to do, and sort of honestly, the, the, you know, the fact that we have to spend a lot of time doing that work is, kind of the weakest part from, you know, it slows down our progress. It makes it harder for us to get stuff to you guys, the fact that we have to do that hard work. Um, so the good news on that is, you know, you've heard some stuff about how, you know, native implementations are coming to other browsers. Um, and the faster the better, because then we can all sort of reap the benefits of that. And, you know, as the platform grows, we grow. And everything's better. So, I mean, that the good news is the weakest point is gonna go away, but it's, you know, for a little bit more time, it's gonna still be difficult. Hopefully just for us and not for you. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna add, you know, yes, and, and what can we do to help? I mean, it's kinda call your senator. It's, it's uh, you, know, make it, you know, make it known to the other browser vendors, you know, how much, you know, we, we really need these, these primitives, especially things like Shadow DOM that are just, you know, vir, you know we try, they're virtually impossible to, to polyfill. Because they're such a core, incredibly needed, you know, you know, piece of piece of functionality in the platform. So as soon as that, um, you know, becomes native, we're all we're all going to benefit tremendously. We can stop worrying about, you know, spending all this time doing the the polyfilling and stuff. Uh, but like Steve said, like Taylor read off this morning, there's there's a lot of really good moment momentum. So we're we're very ho happy about the future. Yeah. So kind of actually following on that a little bit uh, <clears throat> a while back, and this is one of our Twitter questions. Uh, 
Mozilla wrote a blog post saying that they weren't planning to implement HTML imports, instead favoring ES6 modules. So what is the team's thoughts on that? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so I think the, the important thing about that is to sort of note that they didn't say they're not going to do it. They said they're not going to do it right now. They don't think it's a top priority compared with this other thing that's got this other specification and is sort of on track with other ES6 features. So that's fine, and that's reasonable. And Chrome, honestly, is also implementing modules. They've also implemented HTML imports. And the awesome thing about that is that fundamentally, sort of it was something that a bunch of the Chrome engineers, Blink engineers, got together and realized that the fundamental sort of de design parameters of those two systems were compatible. And there should be a way to sort of get the best of both worlds. And there are some people now working on that. And I mean, I think as that evolves, we will hopefully see relatively soon, you know, the glorious future where we have modules implemented natively and they interact correctly with imports and sort of everything works nicely together. Um, this may take a little bit more time, you know, but we're gonna get there because fundamentally I think they're compatible systems. They both have sort of an asynchronous loading model. They both have a lot of commonality in sort of the way that they want to deduplicate resources. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally we're gonna get there. It's gonna take a little bit. And I think at that point, I hope that you know the browser vendors will say, oh, okay, there's a lot of power to having this declarative HTML way of loading resources along with this script-based way, and they should be able to coexist and interact. All right, uh, yeah, once more over here. I guess on a, on a similar vein to what you guys were talking about just now, um, how would you advise someone writing a, a Polymer app now to guard against the possible flux in like uh, API implementations of the different vendors to some of these standards. So someone writing a, a Polymer app now, what would they have to do two years from now when some of these standards might have changed? How could you mitigate some of that? How could you prepare for those, those kinds of scenarios? So yeah, I can speak to that again just quickly. Is I mean, this is kind of what I was alluding to when I said we have this hard work to try to make that substrate of polyfills relatively, you know, sane for cross browser development. So you know, as there as we get, I mean, so far we've really only had to deal with the native implementation in Chrome, and honestly, it's hard to polyfill. So we sort of try to find the sweet spot of the features that we need to get where we can sort of get cross browser performance. As other features come online in other browsers, we're gonna have to sort of take a hard look at saying, okay, so now Firefox implemented this, let's try to let that part be native and let the polyfill fall away here. So we're gonna need to manage that so that you know people using Polymer are not gonna have problems over time. You know, we're committed to doing that. You know, we have a lot of experience doing it at this point. Um, so I mean, I think what basically the answer is is that as you know, as native implementations come online. Polymer sort of, I mean, honestly, the web components polyfills, which really are not part of Polymer, but are used by Polymer, are gonna have to sort of adapt and you know, be able to coexist with the native implementations. So what you're saying is that the polyfills are gonna drop back to the native implementations, or are the Polymer, polyfill APIs gonna change? So, I mean, I think the exact shape of the solution will have to evolve as, you know, if, if you know, Safari implements something that's problematic, versus Chrome, I'm mean, off to see at that time. But the, the notion is that once you get up to the layer of Polymer, hopefully you've got an API that's stable and not gonna, you know, not gonna change out from under you. So we will do the work that we need to do. I mean, I can't promise anything, good God, God knows what's gonna be actually implemented, but we're working really hard to make sure that it's reasonable and follows the spec, and so far all signs are good. So, I mean, I don't really anticipate anything, you know, that's gonna be fundamentally like so hard to deal with there. I think, you know, I think, you know, Pretty soon, let's hope that one of the browsers implements native sh Shadow DOM, and the, other than Chrome, and then you know, you can use Polymer's polyfill for that only selectively and not on that browser at that point. So I think it's going to be pretty clear. And from an Elements perspective, we test all of our things both in the Shady and sh Shadow DOM, so that if at least a Shadow DOM comes around, if you're just using our Elements, you shouldn't really notice a change unless you've been cheating and just using explicitly sh Shady DOM things. So um, if anything changes, we'll like at least make sure that the paper elements and the iron elements are gonna work fine. Cool, and thank then, you. Uh, one of our engineers, Peter, uh, today gave a, a, a lightning talk. Uh, I think he said, we got your back. I think that was the, the phrase. You know, so uh, you know, the Polymer team here is committed to kind of helping make any of these transitions as other browser vendors kind of bring their native implementations online. 
to help you adapt and and you know we may have tools and, and that sort of thing to help help convert but we are um, yeah we got your back <laughs> all right uh, another Twitter question uh, what is polymers accessibility roadmap what does that look like Absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, so accessibility is really just very highly integrated into the Polymer library now. Um, so we had a lot of work leading up, obviously, to the 1.0 launch, um, going through all of the testing, all of the identification of any sort of user issues, um, then figuring out the right ways to implement solutions to these issues. But we obviously don't want to stop just at Polymer 1.0 launch. We want to work, and we are working together um, at a very regular basis. So every time that new changes are actually implemented across any of the elements, um, they're going through substantial testing. Um, if any of you were, you know, if you were listening to the talk earlier, um, we've got a, a significant way of testing across a lot of different components. Um, which we've outlined in the gold standard accessibility checklist, which is available on GitHub. So we definitely encourage that everybody takes a look at that. Um, so that will give you a sense of kind of the different use cases that we are testing for, for each of the individual elements. Um, so things like, of course, keyboard focus, focus states, um, keyboard interaction, is that working? Things, um, testing with screen readers and making sure that everything is, all the declared semantics are working properly. Um, labels are implemented the right way um, so that a screen reader can get the most clear and intuitive um, spoken feedback to the user. Um, then looking at things like contrast and, and color, the way the colors are rendering, magnification, all of these are being regularly tested um, across multiple browsers, multiple sets of assistive technology and screen readers, um, and multiple operating systems. So this will continue um, in addition to some automated testing. So for instance, the Accessibility Developer Tools Audit, that's all being executed on a regular basis. Um, and moving forward, I mean, accessibility is definitely a moving target. Um, this is a dynamic world that we live in. So I would say, you know, we're, we're basing all of this based off of the use cases that we can think of now. Um, for the users that are out there with varying assistive technology needs. But who knows what sort of technology is going to come out in the future. I mean, that's an amazing thought, that things might come out in the future that can totally revolutionize our world even more. Um, so, you know, as that happens, we'll have to incorporate that into testing. And also, we'd love any additional feedback. Like, if there are additional use cases that some of you can think of right off the bat of, oh, well, you know, you should consider this or that. Um, let us know for sure. I mean, we've got the, the Polymer Slack channel. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Anything that you need, like we want to be listening to you and incorporating that feedback and working that into our roadmap. Um, also, I think my personal next plan for accessibility is RTL. We've like s sort of slacked off on RTL really badly, and the Chrome settings page is coming after us. Um, so RTL will get better and maybe look at internationalization. That's a thing. That's on the road map. map. And uh, also, Laura mentioned the Polymer Slack channel. If you are not already on that, that is at polymer-slack.herokuapp.com. Polymer you can go there to, to hop in the channel and discuss things. All right, let's take another question from over there. Uh, hi. Um, so I really liked uh, the, the mediator pattern. Um, and I was also wondering if you have any experience with um, like taking a donor application, which is, for example, an Angular application, and wrapping it in your own component and then reusing it in your app. Um, is that something like you have any experience with rebuilding uh, Google Apps, or is it just, well, do a green field and take it from there? Uh, you mean specifically just like literally putting something that was already built in some other technology in, in you know, kind of hiding that in a custom element and then using that? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we actually, I mean, it's kind of funny that there are a lot of, because that like declarative, you know, interface is so powerful, we, we do this wrapping a lot. I mean, not specifically with, with you know, a full Angular application, for example, uh, but there's no reason that, that you can't, right? You have lifecycle callbacks um, and you have a DOM node in which to render stuff. And so, for example, like people do s stuff with uh, D3, for example. Um, you know, th there's a lot of examples, you know, you, you, we've often taken like jQuery widgets or something like that, something that's really useful, and then you can just, you know, you pull in those dependencies through its import, uh, and then in the custom element, you can just hide all that, you know, r r have the jQuery widget or whatever render itself into, into the, the local DOM, uh, and you kind of, you can totally expose that out uh, as an element. So, yeah, fully possible. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're going to take... These will be the last three questions, the speakers up here. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start over there, actually. You, sir. 
Sorry to ask you another one. Uh, so Eric talked about when, uh, to, to get better performance out of the polyfill, you only load it on browsers that need it. Uh, and as browsers start adopting features, that gets more and more complicated. I was wondering if you'd thought about maybe making that into a Bower component that was version based on different browsers that we could pull in. That's a good idea. <laughs> Um, and I think that, I mean, so far we haven't really had this problem because mostly it's been, the native implementation has been on Chrome. I think this is something that, it's a thing that we'll have to evaluate as some of the features are coming online in other browsers for sure. Um, and yeah, I think we'll try to make sure that that continues to be straightforward and as easy as possible. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely evaluate case to case. I, you know, that reminded me of a case, uh, we, you know, there are, uh, there are like two or three small things that we ship in the, the Web Components light polyfill that are only there for IE. It's like, you know, for IE 10, you need, you know, they don't have, I don't know, weak map and uh, mutation observer and a few things. So we, uh, we, we polyfill those and, you know, we, we kind of had this question. It's like, well, that's like four, f you know, 4K. Maybe we should make a different version of, of Web Components light just for, just for IE. So like for you know, so, so that you could do that. And that one, it was like, no, you know, maybe for the complexity of having to explain that to all you guys, like use this one for IE, and you know, m maybe the 4K is okay. But you know, if that if that got to you know something significant, we would totally look at uh, doing that. All right, yes, sir. Hello, I have a question about internationalization. Uh, you have any plans, any tools, elements to use for internationalization? Yes, um, absolutely. So there's an element for that. Uh, <laughs> so they're actually, I, I talked a little bit to this uh, at the beginning, and this is kind of our typical answer, um, at least today, uh, for, for internationalization and similar topics, which is there are a whole bunch of different strategies that you can use for internationalization. Um, so we've, we've already seen a lot of different apps. Um, you, you have different techniques of, of approaching internationalization. Um, Eric Bettelman actually wrote uh, a great uh, example with the Santa Tracker uh, that launched uh, with Polymer, uh, which used you know one I think it was I18 message, um, and it was a filter or a, a expression um, around the binding system that looked up uh, translations to be able to do internationalization. That's one approach. Uh, we've also written I18 Next element, uh, which uses a slightly different approach to mapping out uh, translations and things for internationalization. This is absolutely something uh, that we want to tackle with the carbon element set, this new kind of element set that we're just working on uh, to do app level structure. So inter internationalization will be a big piece of that. Uh, of course, it will not be necessarily you know, the only solution. All of these are good solutions and it really depends on what you need for your application. Uh, but we do want to build a, a kind of polymerific internationalization solution uh, with, with that component set. So coming relatively soon as we build that, that set out. But in the meantime, there are these existing solutions out there uh, that, that have worked successfully on various applications. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Last question. Hey guys, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for all your work, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the, the specs are awesome, and, like, you guys got to go through a lot of stuff. I mean, also the other, the other browser vendors. It's, it's really cool what you guys are trying to do. Um, yeah, I, I had a question, because, I mean, like, Isomorphic and, and universal. This is this is becoming like a, a trend right now, right? And um, as well as like native, so React Native, and then you got Angular 2. You can render to to native, and even the command line. It's like it's crazy stuff, right? Uh, is there actually? I mean, maybe this is a stupid question. And it's pretty early, but is there a is there a future in um, other platforms for web components? It's a very good question. Um, so we consider on the Polymer team, we are native. We're native on the web platform. Uh, and we're native to the web platform. We're as tight to that platform as you can possibly get uh, with web components. And that's the, really the value that web components gives us. Um, so one way to think about it, and, and the way kind of we like to think about it, is that that is our native platform. It's the web. Web is only getting better. It's getting better on mobile devices all the time. You get all these benefits building on the web platform that you don't get uh, building natively. And so that is our focus, is building on the web platform, making the web platform the strongest platform it can possibly be for building everything from you know, basic text rendering applications to really full-fledged interactive applications uh, and beyond. So that, that is our focus today. Um, and certainly, you know, Polymer 1.0 is only three months old, so there's a bright and broad future ahead of it, and, and we certainly uh, would be excited to see any experiments or things that any of you would be interested in building uh, to, to experiment with this 
kind of rendered in native. It's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, and what, what Polymer is beyond being native to the web platform, it's also this component model. And the component model and the mediator pattern that Kevin talked about, that's certainly all applicable to other platforms. Uh, and so from the kind of componentization perspective and that philosophy of how you build things, that could apply broadly uh, across platforms. And so you can imagine you know, the, our paper buttons, uh, it's just markup, it's just HTML. If you're building an Android app, if you're building an iOS app, you're using XML to lay out your application anyway. You know, you, you, that translates relatively, it should translate relatively straightforward. Um, so absolutely, it should be possible. Uh, it's not our focus today, um, but we're, we're excited for the future. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I think that's actually the last question. Uh, please give it up for the speakers.